Welcome to Life Sutras, where we have empowering conversations with thought leaders that will inspire you to be a healthier and happier version of yourself. We will explore science, the subconscious, as well as the spiritual. Good health equals harmony between many dimensions of mind, body, environment, and the unknown. Now, the second thing about the treatment, the different medication that's out there, the shortage that's out there, how do we go about that situation? Like remdesivir was one. Yes. Uh, there's also, before I touch remdesivir, uh, the antibiotics, role right. of antibiotics, when to start steroids. Now, steroids has a specific indication. It's a wonder drug. It's a life-saving. It has been shown to decrease mortality. and. Uh, the indication of steroids is that if a patient, there can be different scenarios, mm -hmm. uh, please check with your physician. Uh, steroids, uh, patient with COVID-19 infection who has these symptoms and perhaps his CT scan might be showing some ground glass opacities and his oxygen saturation is going below 92%. Actually, that is the recommendations and guidelines. But you know, there are still, we use differently, somebody is using steroids even if it goes below 94%. So that is, that's okay. So don't use steroids when your oxygen saturation is 98% and your imaging studies is showing uh, pneumonia. Uh, so use that, this is what has been studied and this is the recommendations that use steroids only if your oxygen saturation drops 92%, but you can just keep a window of below 94% as well. Second is the role of antibiotics. You know, if, it is, if you belong to mild and moderate, perhaps you don't need antibiotics. Antibiotics, you know, is a but natural, that it's a viral infection. Why do we use antibiotics? Now, the studies have shown that we see the example from uh, influenza, the flu, the most of the deaths are because of the super added bacterial infections and we are pretty sure that many of the patients of covid infection might be having a super added bacterial infections but again we use antibiotics in a hospital setup where the patient is more sick so uh, there is no added advantage of uh, using antibiotics when the patient belongs to with minor or moderate symptoms Maybe some selected cases of moderate symptoms can have antibiotics. What I'm trying to say that by and large, uh, you don't need uh, steroids, you don't need antibiotics provided unless you meet some criteria. A lot of times you get hospital acquired infections as well and that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why they give you antibiotics in a hospital setting. Mm -hmm. So if you're isolated and you're fine at home, you don't need to start medication because I'm seeing there's an urgency, oh I've got COVID, I need to start medication. I would like to make a small correction here. Um, when we talk in terms of viral, say for example, we are talking about influenza, that's also a viral disease. But the most mortality of influenza is because of super added bacterial infection. And you so can since, get it at home as well? No, not at home. These are selected for selective sick patients who are in the hospital, who have uh, other markers and other things that qualify. Uh, but by and large, uh, you know, uh, there is a proper indication of starting antibiotics. And we also think that there are a lot of super added infection with COVID-19 pneumonia as well. So we are using, but it is for the sick patients, uh, sick and critical patients that we are using. But selectively, some portion of the moderate symptoms, we can use it. But what I'm trying to say that it doesn't have any role in random that you have COVID-19, you start antibiotics, you start uh, steroids. So that is what I'm trying to clarify. There are certain spatial situations uh, like remdesivir, uh, convalescent plasma, plasma, and the monoclonal antibody tocilizumab that uh, is being used. But for the information of uh, general public, you know, these medicines are for select patients with select indications. Again, it's not that you have COVID and now this remdesivir is a magic drug or convalescent plasma is a magic drug or tocilizumab is a magic drug that we need to go around. We are, I'm saying this with reference that there has been a lot of hoarding, a lot of shortages of remdesivir 
and a lot of volunteers are running around, my patient is sick, I need a plasma donor, I need a plasma donor. So remdesivir has been used uh, in select patients who are severely uh, sick and there is a small window, we try to use remdesivir. Uh, uh, it has not shown any benefit over the mortality. But it is being used because there are still some studies that are still going on. But there is a narrow window where we use it. And in those windows, we need to use in a very timely fashion. Right. Same is the case with convalescent plasma. Uh, maybe you may get upset, but because I can understand your situation, because your loved one has COVID, he is sick, and you want to do everything possible so that you don't have any feeling of guilt. But you need to understand that we practice evidence-based medicine. And convalescent plasma, again, is also meant for certain section of COVID-19 infection who are in the hospital, hospital, not at home. Uh, similarly, tocilizumab, monoclonal antibody for sicker patients, uh, not for everyone to take. So that is about the uh, medications. What about you in your ER? Like, what are some of the general protocols? Is there like a blanket protocol you follow for every patient? Because in India, I feel that's what's happening. Everybody gets on Favi flu, Tami flu. They get on some Doxy something. They, you know, they they share their prescriptions. Oh, you have COVID? Here, <laughs> take my prescription. Start the medication. Yeah, absolutely not. There is no blanket protocol. In fact. I would be inclined to say that probably most of my patients, I do nothing. I tell them go home, take over-the-counter medications like ibuprofen and Tylenol to uh, bring down your fevers and give you some symptomatic relief of your symptoms. But most of the patients that come to the ER are not in need of anything more than just that. And I also, just tying back to what you were talking about, uh, Dr. Call, about you know the steroids and the antibiotics, is that none of these medications uh, are completely harmless. I mean, I think that's the other thing that it's really important for our listeners to understand, is that steroids and antibiotics and all of the and remdesivir and all of these monoclonal antibodies are not benign medications. Meaning, if you take them when you don't need to take them, you can actually be harming your body. And I think that's a really critical thing for people to really understand and absorb. Um, because I'll give you a simple example of an unnecessary antibiotic really impacts our gut microbiome. And a large part of our immune system lives in our gut. And so we're essentially, essentially compromising our immunity by taking antibiotics unnecessarily. So I would urge all of our listeners and everybody to only take antibiotics as directed by your physician. Don't take a family member's medication. Don't run out and try to get a medication without proper medical direction. I may add with your permission, uh, you know, we said that the physicians in India are following different protocols. You know, I want to set the message right. You know, Indian physicians are one of the best physicians. Uh, they are very smart physicians. Uh, it is the nature of the disease, you know, at one stage, because this is a new disease and studies are still going on. Every country might be having some different protocols here and there, and same is true with India as well. I remember that when we were in the middle of the crisis and in the beginning, there was a lot of hype about the role of chloroquine. And everybody is saying, why don't you give me chloroquine? It is for prophylaxis. But it becomes an issue uh, and w because evidence-based is something different than creating a hype about a medicine which mm -hmm. doesn't fulfill that criteria. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there are certain situations where in India they use ivermectin, and they use um, uh, other medications. Uh, at this stage as a physician, uh, maybe the studies show later on that they may work. But as of now, there is no significant, there is no um, uh, guidelines to use them. But uh, that doesn't mean in any case that the physicians in India are not smart. They are very smart. No, people the physicians there. are smart. Patients share their own prescriptions. So in India, you you know, you I can take my sister's prescription and go and get medication, and I start taking the medication right. without consulting a doctor. So mm -hmm. you know that that happens very often, where you don't see a prescription, you say, okay, my aunt got it. I'll start taking mm -hmm. the same medications as her. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to clarify yes, so that yes, the wrong sure. message doesn't no, go. No, no, no. Our physicians are working tirelessly. They are doing their best, I know. But very often we don't seek a 
consultation and we just go and jump in and start following mm -hmm. oh i'll follow your prescription mm -hmm. and that um, happens here too i yeah, mean it happens yeah. in the u.s all well, the time here it's yeah. harder to get medication yeah. in india it's a little easier, easier. to get medication yeah. because it's not centralized medical records mm -hmm. can we uh, now talk a little bit about again understanding what is this variant what's going on what is this mutation is there going to be a third wave uh Dr. Latif, can you shed some light on that, please? Yeah, absolutely. So viruses mutate all the time. It's, it's a natural uh, part of evolutionary biology, right? And when viruses mutate, sometimes they become weaker and sometimes they become stronger. And if they become stronger, it essentially means that they can proliferate faster and perhaps cause infections at variable rates. And I think the, um, you know, the biggest thing that, that is going on are people are getting very frightened about these mutations, mutations, and the reality is that it, this virus is never going to stop mutating. Um, and that is just a, a, just the, a fact of reality, right? I mean, the flu virus mutates every year. That's why we all get vaccinated with a flu shot every year, because it changes. And so essentially when we're creating these vaccines, we are the CDC uh, is basically making a prediction of what strains are, are potentially going to be the most impactful in a given year, and they create the vaccine based on that information. My hypothesis is that that is probably the direction that we're heading with COVID um, and that this is going to just be a part of our life. Um, but hopefully it will become to the, get to the point where it's well controlled, just like the flu is controlled. So this new variant, uh, which is called the B1617, the thing about it, uh, which is the Indian variant, is that it's, it's basically a double mutant. Okay, and there's two different mutations. The first mutation um, is very similar to uh, the mutation that was found in the UK, the South African, and the Brazilian variant. The second mutation was actually the one that was uh, first seen in California. And let me, let me make a little correction. That first mutation is similar to the one that we saw in South Africa, Brazil, and in the UK, not exactly the same. Um, but essentially, uh, the first mutation is actually is, is what we call an escape mutation. And that is why this is causing uh, such havoc in India because, and they use that terminology to describe a mutation or a type of virus that can essentially escape the immune system so that when people are, are infected, it, the virus has a way of sort of dampening our immune response. And that is the reason that this is uh, such a frightening strain, and that is the reason that our rate, the rates are so astronomic. I mean, India has set a global record, right? I mean, they've been on, I think, on a now a six or seven day streak, and yesterday was the highest, 361,000 uh, new infections, and I think, you know, about 200,000 uh, people have died. Um, so it's quite frightening. Um, but these but, are very, very conservative numbers. Yes, From what exactly. I'm hearing is the number could be 15 to 20 times yes. the numbers that are being reported. Exactly, exactly. But the good news is that there was a neutralization study that was done in India that does show that the current vaccines that we have are effective against this variant. Um, obviously, uh, you know, India is a little bit behind uh, the U.S. in terms of vaccine administration. And I think that is what, for me personally, is so frightening. Because right now, India is only administering about 2.2 million doses per day, which means that by the end of the year, only 30 percent of the population is potentially going to be vaccinated. And in order to, to vaccinate the entire population of India, we would have to increase our vaccination doses to 100 million a day, which is, you know, a, a, an insurmountable task, in my opinion, based on the availability of the vaccine. And the vaccines that, of course, are in India are different than the ones that we have here. And when one of them is an AstraZeneca uh, uh, vaccine, and then there's another one as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I think the take home here is that um, there are so many things that we can do to impact and optimize our health, given the current crisis. There are, we've already talked about a lot of them. We've talked about um, the importance of movement. We've talked about the importance of meditation and relaxation techniques, which will increase your immune response and enable you to, one, hopefully not get COVID, and two, if you get it, put you in a position where your body 
is innately able to fight it on its own. Um, sleep is another huge one that I feel is very commonly overlooked. Um, when people are in panic or maybe taking care of loved ones, the last thing you do is think about yourself, right? And so you end up compromising your own health by not taking care of yourself. But the reality is that you can't take care of anyone you love if you're not taking care of yourself. So sleep my, is probably one of my number one recommendations because at night when we are sleeping is when our body heals. It's when our body is going around and think of them, think of your body as having little trash trucks and going around and collecting debris and collecting uh, you know, free radicals, which are damaging molecules that are both produced by our body as well as being exposed in our environment and put into our body in the form of food, right? If we're not eating proper, clean, healthy, nutritious food. And so our body has these trash trucks that essentially go around at night and collect all this debris, collect all these bad things and take Take, and our liver takes a fat-soluble toxin, turns it into a water-soluble toxin that we are then able to eliminate. And a lot of this happens at night when we're sleeping. So if we're not getting, my recommendation is seven to nine hours of sleep is a minimum. I think, honestly, eight hours is a minimum. Eight to nine hours of uninterrupted, high-quality sleep. How do you do that? There's a lot of different tips and tricks. Um, one is no blue light, meaning no screen, no phone, two hours before bedtime. If you have to do it, you know, just as you can get a pulse oximeter for $20 online, very readily available, you can get blue light glasses that are also 10 to 20 bucks, and that will block blue light. Uh, blue light is a problem because it, it interferes with our circadian rhythm, and it will make us, it will uh, make it very difficult for us to get into our deepest sleep cycles. Um, also refraining from eating three hours before bedtime. Um, and it's really important also to go to bed and wake up at the same time every day because our bodies love habit. And so sleep is another really, really important uh, aspect of self-care. Nutrition is really, really important, right? So there's lots of superfoods that we can eat. Um, you know, that are going to empower our immune system. Things like, I mean, one of the most common uh, Indian spices is turmeric, and it's amazing for your immune system. So, you know, put a little extra turmeric. Garlic is another uh, healing uh, food. And lots of nutrient-dense foods, like dark leafy vegetables, um, cruciferous vegetables. One of the supplements, actually, that has been studied uh, to, be, to decrease viral replication in the case of COVID is sulforaphane. And you don't have to go out and find sulforaphane. All you have to do is eat cruciferous vegetables. If you eat things like, you know, um, cauliflower and broccoli, those are all cruciferous vegetables uh, that you can naturally boost your immunity. What about and supplements? Like people are just overloading on zinc and vitamin C. What are your recommendations around that? Yeah, so I mean, supplements I think are great because supplements are a, uh, you can fall back on them. But the reality is everything in these supplements is found in food. So if you are eating a nutrient dense diet, if you're eating a balanced mix of fruits and vegetables and lean protein uh, from good sources, then you're probably gonna be quite all right. Mm -hmm. um, vitamin C and vitamin D are probably two of the most highly studied um, uh, supplements that really do enhance our immune system and have a have a clinically proven role in uh, helping with COVID. Um, zinc is another big one that people are commonly taking that actually works quite well. And then there's a lot of other ones that people don't think about. EGCG, for instance, is an antioxidant that is in green tea. And you can get the same amount of green tea that you would find in a supplement just by drinking like two or three cups of brewed green tea in a day. Um, so there's a lot of ways that we can do this naturally. Um, one of the other things I forgot to add about turmeric is that the active molecule in turmeric that boosts immunity is actually uh, exponentially elevated in terms of its bioavailability and efficacy if black pepper is added. Mm. So make sure whatever you're cooking, whenever you're cooking something with turmeric, and this is not hard to ask in India, mm -hmm. make sure you add a little pepper mm -hmm. because black pepper enhances the bioavailability of the active molecule in curcumin or turmeric um, that is healing. Yeah, Great. It's a light knowledge, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. I think. Today's episode has been very beneficial because it makes us stop and think, what am I doing to take care of myself? How can I take 
better care of our loved one. And very importantly, don't isolate them so badly. You can go near a loved one. You, you can protect yourself. I mean, can you also tell us a little bit about how to derobe or how do you approach, how can you take care of a loved one and physically not, you know, isolate? Absolutely. That's, that's the important aspect. Absolutely. And that's also very, that's a great point. It's very well studied in the literature that social interaction causes a biochemical change in our body and is essential to healing. Um, you know, that's the reason that, that communities are, are so emphasized in, in various cultures and especially in, a, in, in our Indian culture, right? Community is such a big part of who we are. And so I agree. I mean, we, do, we cannot isolate because isolation is sure, a sure way to a downward spiral. We have to stay together, but we have to be safe when we do that. So, um, you know, definitely a mask, um, you know, and if you're concerned about is your mask good enough, wear a double mask. I mean, so if I'm hospital, going and taking care of a, a sick patient. Yeah. I wear an N95 mask, is that the first choice? You don't have to wear an N95 mask, right? Yeah, the recommendation is that, you know, this COVID-19 has a huge social implications. We have parents living in the same household and say, for example, parents are having their elderly, their 80 year old, they uh, need social interactions and let us say that somebody gets COVID, so he needs to be isolated. So what is happening is that now, their isolation, they are just left for themselves. Not that I mean to say this is the nature of the disease. Uh, disease, but there are ways that you can approach the patient, but you have to maintain highest level of precautions. And what are those? Like we do in the hospitals, we go very close to the patients. We wear a gown, um, it's a plastic gown, uh, wear a surgical mask, I would re recommend wear a double surgical mask. Mm. If you have N95, this is the N95 that I'm wearing. This is N95. Uh, it gives some little difficulty in breathing by itself because yeah. it's a little tight. So if you have an N95, that's definitely good. This is the best uh, prevention. But if you do not use double surgical mask, but what is more important is to wear a face shield. This is a barrier because this is a droplet infection and it spreads if somebody coughs. So these droplets goes into your mucosa and cause the cascading effect of inflammation. So wear a uh, face shield, wear gloves, you can go close to him, close to the patient close to the elderly where you they Can we have. go and give them a little bit of pulmonary rehab? Absolutely. That's the we other thing that. we didn't talk about yes. is yes. avoiding a downward spiral and landing up in the ICU. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. That is the way we have been dealing and that is nothing else I'm doing at least uh, to take care of my patients. The only thing this addition is N95 and on top of that is a face shield and I put a gown and then when I leave the patient then we need to disrobe it uh, in a proper way and then wash your hands, wash your, uh, use sanitizers, wash your stethoscope, whatever is exposed. That, that is very, very important. One more thing I would like to say that, you know, we do talk about uh, surgical masks, N95. Do you know simple things like hand washing? Hand washing has shown with simple soap, if you don't have a sanitizer, hand washing has shown very good results in preventing because you know, you need to be very careful about this area, your eyes, your nose, your mouth. This is the entry. This virus outside uh, the human body, outside the respiratory system is nothing. It will be killed in just few seconds if we use the sanitizers we use. But the sanitizers that have isopropyl alcohol, about 70%, that is recommended for use. And that is perhaps if we yeah. do these measures, we are definitely going to take a significant step in protecting ourselves. So with this strobing, you were saying there's a special step, one, two, three. Can you yeah, highlight that? Yeah, please? absolutely. So I mean, if you are wearing a face shield, masks, gloves, and a gown, um, you want to disrobe in the right order. And you want to make sure that you are putting it on a surface, which eventually you will disinfect. Um, when I disrobe, uh, the first thing I do is, you know, take off my, um, my face shield and I'll put it down. 
The mask is the last thing that comes off. You want to keep your mask on until the very end. And in between taking things off, even with your gloves on, use hand sanitizer. So take off your face shield, put it down, hand sanitize. Take off your gown, make sure that you put the inside out and dispose of it, hand sanitize again. And then take off one mask, hand sanitize again, and then finally your, your, and then actually I would leave the last mask on until you finish cleaning whatever you need to clean, dispose of everything you wanna get rid of, and then eventually when you're in a safe space, um, you know, isolated and away from wherever you need, for, from an infected person, then in, in your house, hopefully, that's when you take off your last mask. Well, so. Thank you so much. The, the, Can I yes, ask some please, important course. thing that I just, I don't think we covered that, you know, certain section of the population needs definitely uh, utmost care because patient, elderly, 65 and above, those who are having uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, those having uncontrolled diabetes, those having um, underlying cancers who are immunosuppressants, who are on immunosuppressant therapies, they need to be very, very cautious and they need to follow highest level of precautions till this surge is going on and what I would say this surge is going to peak it's the peak is yet to come it's going to it's I'm not spreading the panic I'm just telling you and alerting you that what to expect in coming days and that is what has been going on for last one week the numbers the way it is going so it demands a very highest level of precautions from all the citizens of the India and especially the vulnerable sections of the population that is elderly with all the listed things I discussed and basically using masking. Masks have shown uh, because it's a respiratory virus so you need to wear mask, maintain social distancing, six feet at least. Mm -hmm. So these are the majors that Everyone should practice, stay outside the crowd, don't assemble, keep your rooms well ventilated, avoid crowding. So that is really very, very important. And this message, uh, keeping in view the current scenario and expecting few days. Now, why I'm saying, can I take two more minutes? Please take your time. This is an important message. Yes. Now, we see that the numbers are 350,000 today, maybe... God forbid it goes to 400,000. I mean, so under this situation, it will happen. There is a science. These are all epidemiological studies. You know, like we, the unit of weight is either kilo or pound. We have a unit for checking the virulence of a contagion. Mm -hmm. And that is called as R0. So this is for those who are well-educated, who are having scientific backgrounds, they can understand the unit of the virulence of a contagion is R0. So what does R0 mean? R0 means that any contagion, one person, how many can it infect in the vicinity, whosoever that person has the infection, how many can it spread the infection? The more the R0, the more the virulence of the disease. Now the most dreaded infectious disease in old days was measles right. and its R0 was somewhere around 15 to 18. Mm -hmm. So what it means? It means that one person of measles can spread the infection to 15 to 18 people in its vicinity and see the cascade effect and out of those 15 to 18, everyone will spread to 15 to 18. That's how you see the numbers are piling up, how the numbers are piling up. Similarly, with COVID-19, as of now, still the studies are going on. I don't know the latest number of the R0 in India currently, but it, apparently the studies have shown that R0 of uh, COVID-19 is around, no, it's around 3.9. Uh, it's around, it's around 3.9. Maybe the numbers are higher than that, mm -hmm. but that means R0 the, prepares the government, prepares the, all the policy makers uh, how to anticipate the trajectory of the infection. So the R0, we want to keep it below 1. That means that it is contained. But once R0 goes, keep on piling, going high, 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 that means how contagious the disease is. So this, I wanted to give an added information, what to expect in next 
few days, few months because it's going to go up, then it will plateau and then it will start dipping. So this is the trajectory of any uh, pandemic and in that process as Dr. Latif said that a virus can become more virulent, it may become more passive, it may become, it may change its shape what we call as mutations. All these things can happen in this trajectory. So this is very important to understand uh, the concept so that you know what are the challenges and uh, what to do next uh, that will be helpful. Thank you, thank you. I'm sure this is one of many more that we would be doing in the coming future. Breathe Easy India and Breathe Easy USA have taken it upon ourselves to spread credible information out there because there's a lot of myths, there's a lot of panic and we want to alleviate that. We are also starting drives to uh, donate oxygen cylinders. We are donating oxygen plants because in the long term and the medium term, we need to strengthen the healthcare infrastructure in India, which is collapsing. And uh, we we have 50 plants going out in the next you know four or five weeks. Uh, our team is working tirelessly with all the governments, with the Indian Army. There are more plants that are going to be available in five, six, eight weeks from now, maybe 12 weeks from now, which is not such a grim situation in the long term. So please do reach out to Breathe Easy India or Breathe Easy USA if you want a plant donated to a charitable hospital or a government hospital. And we will start working on that project because we want to strengthen India. We want to strengthen the infrastructure. And to the rest of the world, this, this mutation can even come here. So I'm hoping that Everything we spoke about today is going to help us all. And let's keep reminding ourselves, step it up. Just do what we can do, at least one person at a time. So thank you so much. I know you're busy physicians. Thank you for taking time out. This has been, I've learned a lot today, by the way. I mean, My I've learned a lot. And we have a small audience here who's learned a lot. But we have a much larger audience that has, I think they're going to find it very, very helpful today. Thank yeah. you. Thank Thanks you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. It's been a pleasure.